All right, friends, grace and peace to you all. Welcome back to Through the Word. Really happy to be here with you guys. This is uh, wonderful, our final class for the season. <clears throat> so we won't be seeing each other for quite some time. We will return, as I mentioned, in the email, September 11th. So we will have an extended time apart. More details about that uh, will be sent over the summer, closer as we return uh, in terms of format, what we'll be looking forward to and all of that stuff. Uh, really excited to cover this evening's topic. The Word of God is the title for the reflection that we will engage in tonight together. Uh, remember, we have been going through the Sunday readings, and um, tonight will be no different. We will be looking at those readings offered yesterday in the Liturgy of the Word. We're going to see what Holy Mother Church has given us in these readings as we are now liturgically in ordinary time. And as I have said often, ordinary time is anything but ordinary. It's always extraordinary, but as we come together, moving through the liturgical season, we will encounter uh, some readings tonight that will draw our attention right to this reality. What reality am I speaking of here? The Word of God. The Word of God. We're going to see how that's collected uh, both in the New Testament and the Old Testament, what we will see in the responsorial psalm and how it all comes together. So again, just the announcement, um, this is our final class for this season. Uh, we will take a break until September 11. Some new announcements will be coming as well. Some other classes, other things I've been working with with regards to uh, the church. And so let's see what's in store. I'm really excited to share that. As many of you know, uh, um, if, you, if you've been receiving the emails, you know that I uh, successfully defended my dissertation. Really awesome. Uh, Woo stuff. Everybody uh, on you, congratulate Joseph. Yeah. On you. <laughs> congratulations, go, Joseph. Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, so Joe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations, Joe, and God bless Thank you. you. Thank you. And God bless you too. Yes, it's it's uh it's really been a a, a wonderful uh journey. I, I've been so blessed. It was uh really a great experience. The the opportunity to to defend the dissertation, to go through the motions there. And I had two great uh, examiners, Dr. Matthew Levering, Dr. Aaron Ritchie's, really, really significant figures in the field of both theology and philosophy. So I was a little, uh, just a little nervous. I was like, oh man, this is going to be serious. Essentially what a defense is, is um, they, the examiners, they take your dissertation that you've spent years writing. <laughs> and if any of you are curious, uh, the dissertation in terms of word count is a roughly around 86,000 words. That's how much, that's how many words I had in my dissertation. So, you know, if you were to kind of like double space and put it all together, it would be roughly about 230 pages or so. So it's a book, right? It's a book that's, you know, with the citations and everything and so I was like okay you know you do all this work and what happens they sit they read it uh the two examiners and you, they schedule the viva the oral defense and they they give you their summary of your work and they they tear into it <laughs> that's the point right they they try to like kind of break it down it's like a, a sort of hazing academic hazing process they really challenge it and want to challenge you to see how you can respond you know you know how do you deal with critiques all of that stuff so it was a really a wonderful conversation the the, the whole defense lasted about an hour and a half which is more or less on average it could go anywhere between an hour and a half to three hours um, so I'm grateful that it was just an hour and a half. 
And after the Q and A and the question and answer and all of that stuff, then they tell you to step out of the room essentially uh, and come back and like, you know, they, they tell you to come back in because they, then they judge, they, they talk among themselves, you know, what they want to, do they want to pass you or fail you or pass you with revisions? Most people who go through the Viva, most students pass with revisions, either major revisions or minor revisions. And I was expecting I would pass with probably minor revisions. I, I felt confident enough that there would be revisions, but probably minor revisions. And to my surprise, to my utter surprise, when I came back, um, I heard, and I almost didn't believe my ears, uh, my wife, Virginia, was there, that I passed with no revisions, which is a very rare thing. And so I was, I was over the moon. You know, I give all glory and praise to God. It's an amazing thing. Um, really excited, so thankful to all the prayers and the support and, and then my advisor who was so solid, everything, just everything came together. You know, when, you, when you're doing the, the will of God, the door is open. And so I've just been so grateful for that. Um, it would be, it would be a, a rather, you know, difficult thing to attempt to summarize what I researched on and write, wrote about. But in essence, um, it was a unique project that did a kind of dual approach. I was doing theology as well as philosophy. And those are distinct fields, <clears throat> distinct studies. There is some overlap, but they are distinct in their methodology. And so it was kind of like a dual approach, looking specifically at the question of what it means to be a human being, specifically in light of none other than the mother of our Lord, Jesus. So there is a quite deal amount of Mariology in it, but a lot of philosophy, metaphysics, French phenomenology, German idea. I mean, all this wild stuff. I mean, it's one of those things, if you were to attempt to read it, you would get a headache. But that's just what it is, right? It's stuff for academics. Um, but again, grateful. And, and I learned so much uh, during the process. And I'm just so, so grateful. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. And again, thank you so much for your prayers and your support. And, um, and I'm just grateful to God that I've been able to do all that I've been able to do in the midst of my own studies and whatnot. So, you know, God is good. All right. So without any further delay, let's jump into tonight's study. The word of God, again, is the title. And we begin here with our reading from the prophets from the Old Testament scriptures, who really is, in a certain way, the prince of the prophets, uh, insofar as his book, of all the prophets in the Old Testament, his book is the largest, right? Uh, uh, roughly around 66 chapters. Uh, the prophet Isaiah uh, is such a significant figure historically and his oracles and his prophetic literature as well. I've mentioned this many months ago, where the prophet Isaiah also contains so many prophecies about Jesus. Uh, and what's so fascinating is that he's writing roughly 600, 700 years before the coming of Jesus, right? So he has a lot of messianic prophecies, prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. And this evening, uh, we're going to look at Isaiah 55, just a few verses here, verses 10 through 11. And uh, here we will see something about, again, the word of God. That is the focus of the liturgy of the word that was given to us yesterday in the Holy Mass. Let me read it and we'll offer some commentary. Thus says the Lord, just as from the heavens the rain and snow come down and do not return there till... They have watered the earth, making it fertile and fruitful, giving seed to the one who sows and bread to the one who eats. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. My word shall not return to me void, but shall do my will, achieving the end for which I sent it. This is God's 
word. What do we have here? We have here an oracle, an articulation from the prophet Isaiah coming straight from God, right? Notice the beginning, thus says the Lord. That refrain, by the way, is found often in our uh, prophetic literature in the scriptures, thus says the Lord. When we hear that, we want to perk up, we want to tune in and pay attention because something quite extraordinary is going to be expressed. And here we have this amazing description from God, no less, comparing his word, God's word, to creation, right? So there is a kind of link and analogy and metaphor being used here. How does it open? Just as from the heavens, the rain and the snow come down and do not return there till. Let's just stop there for a second. What comes down from heaven, right? Precipitation, rain and snow, okay? And this descent, this descent, right, from above to below does then something for the earth, right? It doesn't descend just to go back up. It descends, as we all know from basic experience, when it rains, it rains, when it snows, it snows. You're going to feel it. You're going to see it, right? You're experiencing it. And notice what the Lord says through the prophet Isaiah, that it doesn't return, doesn't con it doesn't get caught up in the water cycle and return without first doing something. That is watering the earth. What is the key idea here? Well, the watering of the earth does something. It makes it fertile and fruitful. Hmm. Thank God for the rain. Amen. Thank God for the precipitation that comes down, even though we can get annoyed with it, right? But just from a purely meteorological and geological uh, ex reality, we thank God for it because it gives through this process seed to the one who sows and bread to the one who eats. These are, of course, productions that come out of what we may take for granted, which is precipitation, the flow. But notice again the use of the metaphor here. Notice again the use of the connection with this, right? The key phrase here is fertile and fruitful. I've emboldened that for those of you who are zooming in, you can see it. And where God then says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. My word shall not return to me void, but shall do my will achieving the end for which I sent it. Bishop Robert Barron had a beautiful homily on this word uh, this past week. And in it, he articulates something that I myself am familiar as a philosopher, uh, where in philosophy, there is a segment in philosophy that philosophers will study language. It's kind of like a philosophy of linguistics. And what happens there, it's really interesting, is, is that you discover a number of things, of course. One being that we can distinguish between two kinds of speech acts, if you will, two kinds of speaking, right? There's a kind of speaking that is descriptive, that describes whatever is there. And then there's another kind of speech or speech act that is performative. That, that is to say that the words actually do something. And what God is saying here is that when God speaks, his word is not merely descriptive, but it is performative. It does something, right? That's what, that's what God is saying here to the prophet Isaiah. It will not return back to God void. No, it will return and do what it will do according to the will of God. So God's word is not merely descriptive, but what? Performative. Okay. Very quick example of that. And Bishop Robert Barron gives this. Think of a, a, a police officer saying, you are under arrest. Right? Those very words, <laughs> when a police officer or a law enforcement a, a person, right, an agency of any kind, says those words, guess what? You're now under arrest, right? Uh, that's it. The words affect a kind of change in reality, okay? 
And, and, and God, through the prophet Isaiah, is saying, this is something we need to understand with regards to him, with regards to God. And God doesn't, when he speaks to you and I, something changes. Hallelujah. When God speaks to us, something occurs. Now, <clears throat> I want us to open our minds and hearts to this concept just, just for a minute. Let's stay here. And I want to posit, or rather pose the question. Here's the question I want to ask. How has God been speaking to you in this season of your life? Right? Just, just, re just reflect on that for a minute. How has God been speaking to you in this particular season of your life? Now, mind you, God is always speaking. God is always speaking. That is to say, he is always revealing a word to us. The question is not whether or not God is speaking to us, but rather whether or not we are listening. And how can we listen to what God is saying? Well, we need to position our hearts. We need to create space in our life through certain practices, through certain devotions, to hear God. Prayer, unfortunately, sometimes is just one way directed. Right? It's kind of like a one-way street where we just offer our petitions to God, but we don't sometimes wait for a response, or we sometimes don't create space to hear from God. And, and I want to invite us to think about if we're in that area, why might that be the case? So there are two things here, right? Number one, what has God been saying to you in this season of your life? And if God hasn't been speaking to you, he hasn't been directing you, he hasn't been putting a certain word on your heart, and it can happen through many different means, why do you think that is? Is there a block? Have we not maybe been spending enough time with the Lord? <clears throat> Does our prayer life look kind of unidirectional and, and not open to sort of dialogical, mystical reality? God speaks through the scriptures. God speaks through, of course, holy mass. God speaks through the sacraments. God speaks through our devotions. God speaks through silence. God speaks through songs and hymns and spiritual songs. There are many ways in which we can discern the word of God. And why this is important, dear friends, is that when we hear something from God, don't take that now as literal hearing, right? But again, discerning the word of God. When, when we do that, we are opened to God's performative action in our lives. But do we believe that God is addressing us? Stay with that. Stay with that. Listen to this again. Thus says the Lord, just as from the heavens the rain and the snow come down and do not return there till they have watered the earth, making it fertile and fruitful, giving seed to the one who sows and bread to the one who eats, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. My word shall not return to me void, but shall do my will, achieving the end for which I sent it. Hmm. What is God saying to you and I in this season of our lives? Uh, I mean, I'm intentionally slowing down here, friends, because I think this is really important for us to, to, to really get, right, to listen to. In the measure 
we hear God's word, we receive his word, is the measure by which we will experience transformation. What that transformation looks like essentially is growth in the spirit, growth in sanctification. But that can take many different forms. Growth in sanctification could look like for us uh, a clear direction that we are to go in. Right? We are being led by God in terms of a certain decision we need to make in our life. Or growth in sanctification could look like identifying those areas that cause us to sin or that cause us to fall short of the glory of God, and then making adjustments in our life. Right? Growth in sanctification, growth in holiness, in other words, can look differently depending on where we are in our lives. But the, catal the, the catalyzing power of that comes from hearing the word of God, being open to the word of God. Now, this is going to be very important when we get to the gospel reading tonight, all right? Because as we will see, when Jesus teaches the parable of the sower and the seed, what distinguishes the outcome is the quality of the soil. The quality of the soil, a metaphor for the heart. So this is where all of it will begin to connect. So we moved, however, from the prophet Isaiah in the divine liturgy, of course, to the responsorial psalm. Psalm 65, verses 10 through 14, reads, You have visited the land and watered it. Greatly have you enriched it. What land, what land has God watered? the land, the church, the soil of your heart and my heart, our very soul. Friends, when we open our hearts to the word of God, to the sacramental graces, when we intentionally come to the table with hearts wide open, when we come to the hearing of the, the homily or the reading of the word with an expectancy, we are being watered. We are being thus then enriched. It goes on to say here, Psalm 65, God's water courses are filled. You have prepared the grain. Thus have you prepared the land, drenching its furrows breaking up its clods, softening it with showers, blessing its yield. You have crowned the year with your bounty. You, you see the language of abundance that's being expressed here, right? All of this is in context in the Psalms speaking in one sense, literally about a geographical era or area right? The people of Israel relied on God for healthy harvest, for healthy rainfall, and all of that. But it's also read spiritually, not just the physical land, but the land of our hearts and our souls. And this is language of abundance, friends. Listen to that. You have crowned the year with your bounty, and your paths overflow with a rich harvest. Don't we want to be a people marked by this abundance in our own hearts? I know I do. I, 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 want, I want to make space for the blessings of God, for the rain, for the shower of his word to bring about a deep transformation to till the ground of my heart so that I am more irrigated and thus breathable in the spirit, allowing fruitfulness, the fruit of the spirit, 
right? This is what St. Paul speaks of, right? Echoing Jesus, the fruit to be made manifest in our lives. It goes on to say, the untilled meadows overflow with it, and rejoicing clothes, clothes the hills. The fields are, are, are garmented with flocks and valleys blanketed with grain. They shout and sing for joy. Right? The outcome is indeed a joy, a joy, as Jesus himself will say in the Gospel of John, that the world cannot give. A joy that the world doesn't even know about, but a joy that is made readily available to you and I in and through the church. Question, do we believe this? Now, remember, when, when we ask the question, do we believe, it's not merely an intellectual assent, but are our hearts really nodding? Not our heads only, but our hearts. Like, yes, Lord. And if we find, by the way, if we find that we're struggling in belief for whatever reason, then we bring that too to God. God, I, I'm struggling with this. I, I, I want to believe you're speaking to me, Lord. I want to believe that you have a word for me. Jesus, I want to believe that you're with me. And that you long to be with me, but I'm struggling. I'm struggling in, in hearing you or maybe opening my heart up truly to you, Lord. Help me by your spirit. Help me to discover the root cause of that. Where is that coming from, Lord? What, what, what blocks might there be? Because if we want to be a people who are marked with this abundance, then we, these are the kinds of questions and prayers we ought to bring. This then leads us to Romans, right? Romans chapter 8, that wonderful letter written by St. Paul the Apostle to the church in Rome. Romans chapter 8, 18, verses 18 to 23, it reads as follows. Brothers and sisters, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are as nothing compared with the glory to be revealed for us. Now, I've emboldened that because that's such a beautiful promise. That's a, that's a verse. That's a scripture of hope for us. Look, I mean, look at that. Now, when St. Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are as nothing compared with the glory to be revealed to us, what, what does he mean by the glory? He's refer referencing heaven. This is a man marked by profound suffering. If you read the writings of St. Paul, the letters, and especially the book of Acts, you will see he went through hell on earth. I mean, he was beat up. He was stoned multiple times. He was whipped, flogged, put in prison, was shipwrecked. Shipwrecked multiple times. I mean, this guy suffered so much and he has the audacity to say yeah i consider the sufferings of this present time as nothing compared to the glory to be revealed by that's a it's one thing to hear like joe saying that or somebody like <laughs> say it. it's another thing hearing saint paul saying that because imagine him saying that and looking at him with the scars on his body, okay, the scars on his body, he may have looked in certain seasons of his life emaciated. He went for days without eating, weak, tired, but empowered by the spirit. And he says, I consider it as nothing compared to what is stored up for us. Oh, my gosh. And St. Paul, by the way, got a glimpse he was taken up to the third heaven. He writes about this in 2 Corinthians. He was taken up. He was given a vision that he says, words just are too impoverished to speak. It's not even lawful for me to begin to describe or to attempt to describe what, what I saw, which is why St. Paul also says, 
eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart or the mind of the human being, what God has in store for us, especially for those who believe. And so he goes on to say here, for creation awaits with eager expectation, the revelation of the children of God. What does that mean when he says that? For creation awaits with eager expectation, the revelation of the children. Who are the children of God? The church. And the all of create the created order is waiting for the church, the church militant, ecclesia militantes, right? In Latin, the church militant, the church on earth to be revealed in glory when Christ returns, right? So when the church is made glorified in her fullness, then all of creation will shine and shout and will also be fully revealed, right? So this is profound mystical language speaking, gesturing towards an age that is to come. He goes on to say, for creation was made subject to futility, not of his own accord, but because of the one who subjected it, in hope that creation itself would be set free from slavery to corruption and share in the glorious freedom of the children of God. So, so we could spend a long time unpacking this. We don't have the time to do so. But there's so much really being said here. Uh, one of the things that he's helping us see is that there's this intimate, even intrinsic connection between us humans and all of creation. Now, what happens to us, by extension, happens to creation. And he also says here that all of creation is subject to futility, that there is a corruption. What this is speaking of, of course, is death and decay, right? And, and, and insofar as there's death and decay in the world, in our bodies, we all will die. This is an indication that the glorious one, Christ himself, has not yet fully come. He is to come. We're waiting for his arrival, the parousia in Greek, the second coming, of which then everything will be liberated. And so St. Paul then goes on to say, we know that all creation is groaning in labor pains, even until now. Look at this maternal metaphorical language. Isn't that interesting? That all of creation is groaning in labor pains. I mean, just visualize that. For those of you who are mommies and grandmas, you, you know, you could do more than visualize that, right? You know what labor pains entails, yeah? I mean, just that groaning in labor. So what does that signify? Ah, that all of reality is giving birth to something. When Christ returns, that is the culmination of the birth. But until then, the pains are upon us and all of creation. So he says, yeah, we know that all creation is groaning in labor pains even until now. And not only that, but we ourselves, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, etc. We also groan within ourselves as we wait for adoption. That is the redemption of our bodies. I mean, if we really pay attention to what St. Paul is saying here, I think everybody could be like, yep, amen to that. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it in the body. My body fails me at times and this, that, and the third. But the spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. As St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we are given a an unbelievable, a surpassing treasure in earthen vessels, our bodies being the earthen vessels. We're weak, we're subject to decay and death, and yet we are being renewed in the spirit day by day, growing 
through the sacramental graces in the power of God. And what we see here in this language now, because we can ask the question, well, why, why does church, why does the church give us this New Testament reading from the epistle? It's all connected. Remember, the word of God will descend and do the work that it was set out to do. Reading Isaiah, reading that psalm that we read. And what Romans is telling us here, Romans chapter 8, is telling us essentially it's describing for us the condition of the world and our bodies and our need for that heavenly rain, for the word of God to descend, to then set the captives free and all of creation free. So that's, what, that's why Romans is here, among other reasons, right? Right. This reading from St. Paul is here because it illustrates for us, it really brings home for us the situation. Right? All of us are bound up in this kind of corruptibility, this futility, this death-like state that robs us. And yet the resurrection. And yet the resurrection is the final word. Hallelujah. And so with this, friends, we then ask, wow, okay, how, how can we receive more of the word? Same question we asked in Isaiah. How can we hear God with greater clarity? How can we right, create space in our lives to be transformed? And thus experience a liberation, even in our very beings. That question is, in a final way, answered here in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. Now, we have a lot of verses. <laughs> we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 23. But what we're going to do, I'm going to read through all of them, but we're going to zero in on a few sections. So please journey with me as we begin to read. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and sat down by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood along the shore and he spoke to them at length in parables, saying, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path. The birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground where it had little soil. It sprang up at once because the soil was not deep. And when the sun rose, it was scorched and it withered for lack of roots. Some seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it. But some seed fell on rich soil and produced fruit a hundred or sixty or thirty fold. Whoever has ears to hear, ought to hear. The disciples approached him and said, well, why do you speak to them in parables? This is a, a question about PR, right? <laughs> public relations. Jesus, you're not making it easy for you to understand, right? It's, it's not even, why are, you, why are you obscuring language, Jesus? What's going on? Why are you speaking in parables, Jesus? And Jesus answers, he says, he said to them in reply, because knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven has been granted to you guys, but to them it has not been granted. To anyone who has, more will be given, and he will grow, and, and he will grow rich. But from anyone who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Let's stop there for a second. What is Jesus saying here, right, on, on, on first blush? This sounds really unfair. Jesus, what do you mean? Those who have will be given more, and those who have very little would even be taken away. Are, are you justifying injustice, Jesus? What are you, what are you saying here? You got to listen carefully to what he's saying. The knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God has been granted to you. Who is the you that he's talking to here? His disciples. What is a disciple? One who has said yes to Jesus, and thus one who is following Jesus. That's a disciple. You and I are disciples. 
we are being led by the master. We are open to his teaching, to his way of life. We are seeking to imitate him in carrying our cross and to walk in his kingdom. We thus are disciples. Amen. And so in this passage, he is speaking to the disciples. And that's a beautiful thing because disciples mean, that word means that these are people who have chosen to follow him. And so in this regard, they already have, they already have a lot. And Jesus is saying here when he says, to anyone who has, more will be given and he will grow rich. Who are those who have here? Those who have said yes to Jesus. Those who are obedient to Jesus. Those who are following Jesus. We're going to follow Jesus. Not easy, but I'm trying to follow Jesus. In that, Jesus sees, and in our following Jesus, in our sitting at Jesus' feet, guess what? He honors that by unveiling to us more of the secrets of the kingdom of God. Why? Because we're special? No, not, we're not special in and of ourselves as compared to those who are outside of the church. What makes us apart, set apart, is our obedience to Jesus. That's, that's where the specialty comes in. It's our yes, our fiat in imitation of our Blessed Mother to God in following Jesus. And in that, Jesus is saying, you guys are going to get the, the secret sauce here. You're getting the, the real insight. Because why Jesus is doing this kind of discrimination here? discriminatory teaching because Jesus sees something we don't see. What does he see? He sees the heart. He sees the heart of people. See, the disciples here, they ask Jesus, Jesus, why are you speaking in parables? But Jesus is not confused. You see, he sees the heart of the hearers and he's not at, in any way duped. The wool is definitely not pulled over his eyes. Jesus is not sidetracked. He sees beyond sight. He sees the heart. And what he's revealing here is, is that if a heart is really open, if a heart is truly seeking to follow him, that heart he will pour his grace into. But those who may be present to Jesus, right? They look like they're there, right? They're physically there, but their hearts are really not there. Those will continue to have the word obscured to them because their hearts are not in the right place. Their hearts are not in the right place. So in, in exp explaining this, Jesus then begins to quote from the Old Testament scriptures, right? So let's read it. To anyone who has, more will be given and he will grow rich. But from anyone who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Again, the key here is the understanding of the obedience of the heart. This is why he goes on to say, I speak to them in parables. Because, quote, here he's quoting here from a scripture in the Old Testament. They look but do not see and hear but do not listen or understand. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, here's another quote. You shall indeed hear but not understand. You shall indeed look but never see. Gross is the heart of this people. You see, there it is. That's the revelation, the heart. Gross is the heart of this people. They will hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and be converted and I heal them. What's, what's being said here? Jesus sees the heart. If your heart is not right, don't expect a word. Don't expect to have clarity. It's a matter of the heart. But if, if we come with humility, if we come with contrition, if we come to Jesus, if we come through his church with open hearts, then he will honor that. This connects, by the way, to where Jesus says in a different, uh, uh, actually in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Gospel of Matthew, the same Matthew, the same uh, Gospel we're looking at, in the Sermon on the Mount, when he makes that weird statement, where he says, don't throw the pearls to swine, <laughs> it's very strong language. Again, it's to say, you have to, be, you have to learn how to discriminate 
to discern the difference among hearts. Don't waste your time with hearts that are closed off, right? Trying to share with them the kingdom. They're going to just, they're going to trample on it. They're going to be like, get out of here with that. So what do you do with those folks? What do you do with people like that? You pray for them. Because only the Father in heaven can open hearts. Only the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, can convict of sin. That's where the work goes. Amen? That's where the work goes. So if you have family or friends that you know, you would love them to see to go to church. You would love them to get baptized. You would love them. Maybe they are baptized. Maybe they are Catholics, but they stop practicing. Rather than taking the Bible and beating them over the head, <laughs> right? How about let's pray for them, asking the Father in the power of the Spirit, through the intercession of the saints, for the conversion of their hearts. Because it's a, it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Okay? So this is the takeaway here from this passage. But of course, it goes on. Now, Jesus goes on to say to his disciples, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Amen. I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. And so what Jesus is going to do, of course, here is what? Break it down. He's going to unpack the parable. He's doing this for his disciples. And by extension, you and I get the insight, right? And insofar as you and I are disciples, we have an unbelievable opportunity to really listen to the heart of Jesus. The seed sown on the path is the one who hears the word of the kingdom without understanding it. And the evil one, the devil, comes and steals away what was sown in his heart. The seed sown on rocky ground is the one who hears the word and receives it at once with joy. But he has no root and lasts only for a time. When some tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, he immediately falls away. The seed sown among thorns is the one who hears the word, but then worldly anxiety and lure of riches, the lure of riches, choke the word and it bears no fruit. But the seed sown on rich soil is the one who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and yields a hundred or 60 or 30 fold. So for those of you who are zooming in, you could see I have color coded this to, to point out the, the, the four kinds of hearers or the four kinds of people or better yet, the four kinds of hearts. You have those, that heart that, is receiving that's like a path right the, the sown on path it's, it, it's there's no soil there's no soil there right so so you share the word there's something of the word of god that goes but the enemy as it were steals that word and, and it doesn't have no place to take root so it's as we say in our culture in one ear and out the other <laughs> that, that's what that is okay that, that's what jesus is saying in one ear out the, uh, and it doesn't matter. You can say it until you're blue in the face. They're not going to get it because there's no soil there. They, there's just, it's just, there's, they're not there. They're not there. Well, Joe, Joe, what can we do for these people? What can I do for my brother or my sister-in-law or for my mom or for my grandkid? They don't, they don't, you pray. Amen. That's where that's, it's the, it's God, the father who does the work to change the hearts, not you, not me. We can actually drive them further away by being a little obnoxious, okay? No, we want to be a witness, but we're not called to proselytize. We don't want to say, oh, did you go to church? You didn't go to church? Oh, man, you, you, you don't shame people into the kingdom of God. You love them. Amen? Okay, this is, yeah, okay? 
Okay. That is the first kind of heart, all right? The path, the path. The enemy comes, boom, evil one steals it away. Okay. In one ear, out the other. Let's look at person number two, the second kind of heart. The sown uh, is a seed that's sown on rocky ground. Rocky ground. So what happens? What, what, what's, what's like, what are these people like, right? What, what is that? Oh, they hear the word and they receive it with joy. They're like, yes, amen. This is good. Ah, yeah. All right. I, I'm down with Jesus. Jesus, yeah, let's go. You know, and there's an excitement. There's a, there's this spontaneity, spunky, spunkiness. Oh, let's go. And what happens? Here's what happens. There was no root, right? There's no root. And, and so the joy, this, this excitement lasts only for a time. So when some tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, that person immediately falls away. It's like, all right, I, I, I liked Jesus. I, I really worked with it. It was cool for like a, like a short time, but I, I can't. It's too much. It's too much. It's too much. I, I don't like people are treating me. People are calling me like they think I'm a religious fanatic now. What? Ah, ah. It's a second heart. It's rocky. It's rocky. There's no, no good soil there. It's just rocks. A lot of rocks. Okay. Now, now, before I go on, let me, let, me, let me say this. This is really important. This is not, this parable that Jesus is giving us here, and he's unpacking it for us, this is not to be just understood, dear friend. This is not to be just understood in terms of a conversion, either you're saved or not saved. That's one way of looking at this parable. But there's another way. We can look at this parable simply by our obedience, day in and day out. In other words, have we ever had the experience of hearing a word from God and it kind of went in one ear and out the other? Maybe we were in a study like this, or maybe we went to Mass and we, we I don't know, just like nothing happened. It was, I went through the motions, but right. That could be an indication. It could be an indication of something going on in my heart. Not always. Not always. Right? We, we could just have a lot of things in our mind. We could be going through a tough time. Maybe the homily wasn't clear. Maybe I was just distracted. Whatever the case is. Right? But if that happens more often than not, maybe something with my heart, my spiritual center is off. Okay. Let, let's look at the third kind of person here. The seed. Sown among thorns. Oh, oh, the seed that is the word of God. Sown among thorns. What, what kind of heart is this? Right, it has thorns. Well, this is the one who hears the word, but then worldly anxiety and the lure of riches choke out the word and it bears no fruit. Friends, a lot of Christians are in number three. A lot of us are in number three. A Let me say that again. A lot of us can fall into number three, right? Because we're like, no, nah, you know, you know, we go to church and, you know, I listen to the word and I try to follow. But really, I like to spend most of my time pursuing the things of this world the riches of this world whatever that is whatever that is a little power a little pleasure a little little spice a little a little little status and honor i, I kind of like that more I, I i like to rub shoulders with the elite of some kind I, I want people to notice me see me right yeah or, or, or i'm just so busy with with the world with life right worldly anxieties so what is that? That ends up choking out the word. So, so the word is there, but it's not bearing any fruit. So we wonder, why, why don't I have peace or joy in my life? Well, where is, where is the, the love that I read about in the Bible, that I hear in the homily? I, I, can't, I have a hard time with this. Oh, okay, okay. If that's the case, well, Jesus is inviting us here to say, well, do I have too many worldly anxieties? 
Am I pursuing the things of this world more than the things of God, the lure of the riches of the world? Because if I am, that's leaving very little space, little space for the fruit of the spirit to bear in my life. Mm. Okay. And so where do we want to be? We want to be the fourth kind of person, right? We want to have the, the, the soil, the good soil. Look at it. It says, but the seed sown on rich soil. Ah. So may our prayers, friends, may our prayers be Father in heaven, make the soil of my heart rich so that you, you can irrigate the land of my soul, Lord. Right? Make it rich, Lord. Take, take away from me worldly anxiety. Take away from me the, the temptations of this world, the lure of the riches. And, and my, right, Lord, take away my fear of persecution and just trouble. Help me, Lord, help me, Lord, to really make room for your word in my heart. Rich soil. And Jesus says it here, sown in rich soil. Well, is the one who hears the word. This is one who hears the word, understands it, and who indeed bears fruit. And look at the fruit, right? Yields a hundred, sixty, thirty fold. This, this is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. And so Jesus says, look, this parable gives to us the secrets of the kingdom. This parable is showing us something important. The four kinds of hearts, the four kinds of people. Why is it that out of four, only one, only a quarter produce fruit? Well, Jesus says, because it is hard to enter the kingdom of God, right? Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many go through that way, Jesus says, in the Sermon on the Mount. Narrow is, is the path to the kingdom of life, to the kingdom of heaven. And very few make it through, Jesus says. That's why. That's why. This is not easy, right? This is, this is as St. Paul will say, a race. This is, as St. Paul will also say, a battle, a spiritual war we are engaged in. There's no way I can be a Catholic that's bearing fruit, that I'm not engaged in battle. That, that's an impossibility. Right? If I, if I am easily, if I'm very comfortable in my Christianity, because it really doesn't cost me anything, that, that's probably an indication that there's something wrong. There's something amiss. There's something amiss. Okay? So Jesus lays it out. He, he lays it out here. And we have the responsibility, dear friends, to pray over these scriptures. I mean, if you want for homework for the next month and a half until we see each other again in September 11th, stay in this scripture, right? Return to it. Allow it to wash over you. Allow it to challenge you. There's something really rich in this, dear friends. Really, really rich. And so I want to say to all of you, enjoy the break. We will return on September 11th, and let us pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, for this opportunity to study your word. We ask that you would bless your holy name and give us, indeed, eyes to see and ears to hear. Be with us over the summer months uh, until as we come towards the fall. Grant us safety, well-being. Be with us, Lord. Help us to truly follow you in all things. It's in your name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me stop the recording. And then we'll come back for a little small group or short, a little large group process. Here we go.